ask your forgiveness. I had a card, I had it in my hand, and still failed to read it this morning. I'll go ahead and read that at this time. It says, thank you for your kindness, says, dear church family. Thank you so much for your prayers during my father's illness and for your prayers, visits, calls, food, and support following his passing. You all mean so much to us, and you have eased the pain of our loss. Thank you. In Christian love and East Henson and family. I apologize for that. I had it in my hand. That's how uh, quickly I can forget some things. Boy, it is good to see you this morning. I am glad that you're here. I wish there was something that I could do about the weather outside. It is very hard to be upbeat and happy and say, hey, let's go, and it's so dreary and dark outside. But be it as it may, that's what we have to deal with. And so we have to remember that the flesh and the spirit are different. But we must never forget that a lot of times the, the flesh, the physical things, man, y'all look crowded over there. You know we have an auditorium over here. You ought to see this wing over here. Man, alive. We could, uh, they're, they're stacked in there like sardines. But it, it certainly is good to see them. I'll have to look over there from time to time. But uh, we're, we're glad that you're here. And we're, we're talking about a series of lessons that I have just absolutely enjoyed doing the memory work. I have enjoyed looking at the text over. It's not text that I'm unfamiliar with, but text that I think that from time to time it's good to stop and to look. I remember years ago, I've already shared this with you, but I'll share it again. Wesley Simons, we were up in uh, East Tennessee, went and visited the Stony Creek Church, and he said, how many of you know the fruit of the Spirit? Can you, think, can you name the nine fruits or fruit of the Spirit, nine components? And it just so happened that I, the week before that, I had memorized those. And I thought, man, that is a tough question. Because most of us just don't think in, in memory work like that. And he says, you know, how can we, you know, show the fruit of the Spirit if we don't know that fruit of the Spirit? And so in our Christian life, in our Christian walk, sometimes we think, man, what, can, what do I need to be doing? What could I be doing that would better serve the Lord? Uh, I'm not feeling like I'm doing the things that I all, what are some things that I can do? And so if you start thinking about, well, you know, showing the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to talk about a lesson this morning. This lesson is not mine. It's a good lesson. You might say it's probably good because it's not yours. But uh, this is from a fellow by the name of Marshall Keeble. And Brother Keeble, one of his famous sayings was that we all needed to be fruit inspectors. Because you can tell fruit, you know, you can tell a tree by the fruit that it bears. And so we started out this series of lessons, first of all, talking about that character, that fruit that as Christians we should have. Do you remember what that was? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, LGG, long suffering, goodness, uh, godliness. Uh, then we said FMT, faith, meekness, and temperance. So those nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. So if I'm sitting around, I'm thinking, man, what could I be doing? Well, first of all, Am I showing the kind of love that I need to be showing as a Christian? I do not want to be critical of the Lord's church. In fact, I love the Lord's church. Without the Lord's church, we couldn't go to heaven. God has placed salvation in the church. When you obey the gospel, the Lord places you in the church. So the body of Christ is indeed an important and wonderful thing. But something that I have noticed in the associations that I've had with members of the church is that sometimes... We're not as kind to one another as we could be. I think uh, sometimes I see other religious groups, and they seem to uh, be kinder to one another than sometimes brethren are. You know, brethren, as we go through these fruits of the Spirit, think about them, love and joy and peace. And sometimes I don't think we have shown the peace that we need to because we haven't had the long-suffering. We haven't had the gentleness. We haven't had the, the godliness, perhaps, uh, the meekness, the temperance. And then the second week, those, those nine that we talked about, the second week, we talked about how we ought to think. You remember that? The things that we should think about. If you notice the things that we've mentioned, love just keeps coming up over and over again. If you love somebody, you're bound to be far more patient with them than you are if you do not love them. Remember we talked about the things that are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just and pure and lovely and of good report. And then the results of that, if there be any virtue or if there be any praise, think on these things. So as we're sitting around and we're trying to figure out, hey, am I being what I ought to be? 
Am I thinking about those things? Am I showing that fruit of the Spirit? And so we've added on those lists each week. And then we talked about last week from Colossians 3, 5 about, uh, you know, in following, putting some things to death and then putting on certain other things. And what were we to put on? Well, you remember, bowels of mercy. There's one of those things right there, to be kind with one another, to have mercy for each other. Uh, kindness, you know, uh, humility or humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man hath a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these, what? Put on charity. Why? Because it is the bond of perfectness. Now take that word charity away and stick in the word love, and you have done that passage no disservice because agapo, that's what that means, love, a sincere care for one another. And so with these three lessons, we go into this last one, which is the idea of the Christian graces. Now, Brother Keeble had the sermon, he called it Five Steps into the Church and Seven Steps into Heaven. And it's in his uh, little old book of sermons. Uh, there's also an autobiography of him in that book. And uh, you remember Brother Keeble was up in the Nashville area, had the boys' school there. That, and he would go out, and just about every week of the year, he would take those young men, and they would hold a gospel meeting somewhere. And then at night, those young men would do the preaching. They would do uh, all the... Uh, you know, the Lord's Supper, singing, all of that. And so they got that training as they were going through his school up there. And, uh, you know, uh, you think of uh, Eddie Brinkley was one of what they would call uh, Keeble's boys and just a great group of young men. But the Keeble uh, baptized thousands of people. But let's think about the first of all, the five steps into the church, how one gets out of the world, quits being an alien sinner and becomes a child of God, and how one ultimately attains heaven in the kingdom of God. And so with that, we would just simply use those initials. Uh, you know, I saw this YouTube video the other day, and I thought it said, how to memorize scripture. And I thought, well, you know, I've only been doing this now about 25 years. might be a good idea to try to figure that out and uh, see if they do it like I do it. You know, it was amazing that uh, they said exactly what I had been doing, but nobody had ever uh, given me a lesson on how to do it. One of those things was using the first letter approach. Now, in the Army, we called that an acronym. And you would just simply make up a word. And the first in that word, like uh, the word salute, size, activity, location, unit, time, and equipment. That was what we were supposed to report in if we saw the enemy somewhere. And it was the, the word salute. And you do that with the first letter. Well, I learned that very on. It's easier to remember a whole bunch of letters than it is to try to memorize those words. And so here we have that approach, the HBRCB. What does that stand for? Well, hear, believe, repent, confession, and baptism, then one becomes a child of God. Then what do we do? Well, in 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 5, Peter would say, Add unto your faith virtue, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and last but not least, Peter's account would say love. Now, Paul, in two of the three we've already looked at, Galatians 5, Philippians 4, Colossians 3, would uh, use love in two of those. This is, this is Peter's account of what we need to be doing. So let's take a look at that. First of all, what does it mean to hear? Well, Romans 10, 17 talks about preaching. Blessed are the feet of those who proclaim the gospel. Uh, a quote from the book of Isaiah, and then Paul would go on and write, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, what does that mean? An understanding, faith, this is true. Why is it true? Because God's word said it. God's word proves that. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. We live in a society today that doesn't prove anything and just says, hey, you believe what you want to believe, I'll believe what I want to believe. You shouldn't judge somebody in their belief and I won't judge you. And in your belief and so forth, which is, as Freddie Clayton, uh, a little bit further north in Sequatchie Valley would put it, is hogwash. That's exactly what that is. Let me come over to your house. I'm sure somebody over there in the wing has a flat screen television. Let me come over and steal your television. And you'd say, Ron, that's wrong. I'm going to call the police. And I'd say, no, it's not wrong. I don't think it's wrong. Why would you think it's wrong? And, you know, it's amazing how people will look at something and say, well, that's wrong. But when it applies to them, but we'll look at stuff in general 
and just say, well, you can't tell them they're wrong. Well, yes, you can tell them they're wrong. I was speaking this week, just, uh, it just frustrates me so much sometimes when I think about people and how uh, they come to an, their knowledge, their knowledge of the truth. I was told that a, a person I'm kin to, you know, had found the truth, and I was like, oh, that's great, and where is that? Uh, and of course, I said they had found it in, in the Catholic Church, and I thought, <laughs> you have not found the truth in the Catholic Church. As a matter of fact, and most of the things that I can think of just right off the top of my head, call no man father, for you have one father into heaven, but yet what do they call every preacher they have? Don't bow to idols, yet what do they do? Uh, pray unto Mary, things of these things that they have just created. The Bible says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but yet they say you come out of the womb, eight days later we'll throw some water on you and you've been baptized. The Bible says... They look out for those who will forbid to marry and command to abstain from meats, and yet these are cardinal doctrines. Do not change the government of the church. There's elders in the local congregation, yet they have papas and bishops and synods and everything. And somebody tells me they have found the truth there. What they found is exactly what the Apostle Paul would say, but take heed unto yourselves and the, and the, the flock that you oversee, because from your own men, from your own selves, shall men arise teaching perverse things or to, to guide people away, not, not sparing the flock. That's what you found. People will tell me they've studied the Bible and they've looked at it and here is what they've come to find because they're so intelligent. They've looked and they said, well, this is the oldest thing around. Just because something's old doesn't mean it's good. You know, as far as I remember, they were off enough their children to Molech uh, before the children of Israel conquered Canaan. You had people doing all kinds of great wickedness in the name of religion thousands of years ago. Absolutely amazing to me. Hearing the word of God. God tells us what's right, what's wrong. There is an objective standard. Yet we live in a time and an age when people want to try to tell us that there is no such thing as an objective truth. Something that's always true. They want to tell us it's subjective and it changes with, the, with time and with circumstances. And that is simply not true. We look at things like murder. It's always wrong to take the life of an innocent person. It is never right to take the life of an innocent person. Um, but yet we're told, you know, that that's okay today. We're told that it's okay for men to be with men working that which is unseemly. And women you, leaving the natural use of the body uh, and doing things that are just terribly wicked. And yet... Our country, our nation, our philosophical system, our education system says, well, you're just looking at that the wrong way. They're saying that that's just fine. They're changing that which God has said and that which our society has been based on for 200 plus years, not to mention all the way back to the cross, not to mention all the way back to Mount Sinai, not to mention all the way back to the garden. The standard objective truth of God's will whereby when God says it's it's true, People don't want to hear that. So then faith cometh by hearing, and not just hearing anything. What does the Bible tell us? There is a way which seemeth right unto a man. In fact, people look at that. Men will look at it and say, man, that's a good thing. We ought to be doing that. But what does the Bible say? What does God say? But the end thereof is the ways of death. And brethren and friends, it's not unkind to tell somebody who is in sin that they are in sin. You cannot be what you ought to be and not tell people that they're lost and lost in particular situations they're living in in their life. As a matter of fact, usually when I'm told something like that and I say something about that, I'm, I'm immediately told that, you know, well, that's their interpretation. That's, uh, you know, that's not the way you ought to look at that. You're being unkind. You're being unloving. And so I don't try to push it to the point where it's an argument or anything ugly is said, but I want them to know that that's not true. And I want them to know the truth. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Not just any hearing. Not just any class and philosophy you may take. Not just in anything they may teach you in a school somewhere. But what does God the Almighty have to say? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Notice the next thing we have up there is belief. You can hear all day long, but if you don't come to an understanding and a conviction of belief that something is then it's not doing you any good. You can't act on something that you don't have confidence in. As a matter of fact, Jesus would say, he that believeth. You've got to understand this, not only understand it, but you've got to incorporate it. It's got to be something you like, yes, that is right. He that believeth and is baptized 
shall be saved. But he that believeth not, you can't even go on to the baptism part because you ain't got the first part right. And yet the very institution I was talking about a moment ago says, well, you don't have to believe nothing. You don't even have to be old enough to even say anything. Just be alive, and we're going to sprinkle some water on you, and you'll be baptized, and you'll be saved. That is not what this passage says. You know, it's un unfortunate that before the Reformation period, the, you know, Catholicism taught, be baptized, don't worry about believing, and you'll be saved. After the Reformation, many want to say, well, it doesn't, don't be baptized, just believe and you'll be saved. But what does that passage teach, friends? It says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and that is just as, you just can't get around that. Both of those are applicable, belief and baptism for salvation. Yet there'll be many today tell you, oh, don't you go there, Ron, don't you think about that. That's not what that passage, well, that's not what that passage means. Let me tell you what Jesus should have said. Folks, that's not how the Bible operates. A lot of people go to the Bible with preconceived ideas and from that try to twist those scriptures or find a particular scripture, even though it may counteract and go against what other things in the Bible say and say, see, there's my passage. That's what's going to get me to heaven. That's how I want to go. And yet the truth has crossed that parallel line. Truth always runs together. One passage is not going to uh, contradict what another passage says, but there's a truth. The truth is never contradicts. If there's an apparent or something that looks like a contradiction, then we've got to go back and we've got to look at other passages that are applicable and talk about that to see what exactly is being saved. Our next letter there is the idea of repentance. Now, what does repentance mean? Most of the time we think about repentance, we start thinking about sorrowfulness for sin. And that's not a, bi a bad description at all. But there's some folks who are sorry about sin that aren't repentant. They're just upset they got caught wish they could have can continue to do their sin but the idea of repentance as we think about in the bible is the idea of changing your mind stop the way you're doing and try to live differently that's the idea of repentance jesus would say in luke 13 3 and then again in verse 5 i tell you nay except you repent you shall all likewise perish change the way you live in your life live how god would have you to live and not how men would have you to live for a lot of people, that's not much of a change in moral things. They were raised up by good moral parents, and so they're morally good, sound people for the most part, but they haven't understood the gospel, and so when they obey the gospel, it's not a big, huge lifestyle change, but now instead of just living because, well, that's what my parents said, and that seems to be good, now they're living because the Bible says this, God says this, God says he wants me to do this, so that's how they live their life. That's the idea behind repentance. Notice the next one we have up there is confession. Now, Matthew 10, 32, and 33 cover this. But my favorite passage to talk about when you're talking about confession is Romans 10, 9. Take it from the very same context that faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Notice what he says. That if thou, me or you, shall confess with thy mouth, that is an oral confession of what? The Lord Jesus. And shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. Folks, that's a part of the salvation process. That's about how one goes about being saved. Just like you need to hear, come to an understanding and believe. You need to repent, do what God says. But you also must make an audible confession that Jesus is the Christ. We do that when we have folks come up and we say, Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Now, there's a lot of implication in that. Things concerning the kingdom, things concerning the understanding of what you're being baptized for. But all of that is a summation of, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. God hath raised him from the dead, therefore he's the God, he's the God man. God sent him, he's divine and man. All of that's implied in this great confession that we make. And then last but not least, now this is where a lot of uh, people would agree with us right up to this point. They say, oh, yeah, man, you got to repent. Absolutely. You have got to repent, and you, you ought to be able to confess with Christ in your life and so forth. But when it comes to the idea of baptism, a lot of people want to leave. A lot of people want to say, well, I can't go there. I, that, you're doing something. You're trying to work your way to heaven. Folks, baptism is not a work of righteousness. It's not something that we do to try to earn anything. As a matter of fact, baptism is something that you receive. The language of Scripture, those verbs that are used in Acts 2 at verse 38, is the idea of passiveness. You're not the one doing the action. 
You're the one the action is happening to. You're simply submitting to somebody, submit, putting you under the water and raising you up. God is the one that does the work in baptism. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12. Faith in the operation of God. When the old man of sin is buried and raised to walk in newness of life, God's the one that did the cleaning up. You didn't do that. God did. You simply submitted to what God has said do. And that's why Peter, uh, in the last book, his first book, would say, the like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. Now, folks, I didn't write that. I didn't come up with it. The King James translated it that way back in the 1600s. Uh, the passage still means the same thing. It meant in the Greek when it was first penned 1,900 years ago. He says no one in his family were saved by water. And he says that's a figure. That's a type of how me and you have been saved by water. If we're children of God and Christians, Peter said that. We didn't make that up. That's something that Peter said. And he says, there's a figure. Let me show you what that, that's a type of. It's a type of salvation. The like figure went to baptism, thus also now save us. He ain't saying it's getting your body clean. No, he says it's an answer of a good conscience. Not putting away the filth of the flesh, but an answer of a good conscience toward God. And he says that it, it saves us. It's a part of that. Now, folks. That hear, believe, repent, confess, and baptism, separate and apart from each other, you can't just take somebody uh, out of the womb and throw some water on them and say, well, we've knocked that out, got baptism done, they can believe and all that stuff later. You can't do that. You can't say, well, I heard one time, well, good deal, you're saved. Or I repented once. Remember that long time ago when I was sorrowful of what I did, want to do what God had me do, but I didn't get baptized, I didn't confess him. You, you can't do that. It's all a part of the same thing. Once you have done these things, you have exhibited that faith, and now as a result of that faith that caused you to confess his name before men, repent of your sins, and to live your life differently, and to be baptized, now as a result of that, Peter says you need to be doing these things. He says, and besides this, notice if you will, let's turn to 2 Peter. I want to go over this with you a little bit because... Uh, well, you know, sometimes when I say besides this, I'm talking about, okay, just lay that aside for a moment. I want to talk about this. That's not what really is being said here. Uh, some of the newer translations bring that out a little better. But in verse 3, <clears throat> if you ever have uh, Mormons come to your uh, door, study with them. This is one of the things that I like to turn to because they'll want to bring the what they would call another testament of Jesus Christ or the Book of Mormon. They also have the Doctrines and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, and yet a third book that I can't remember. And they like to study those, although they'll tell you that the Bible's a good book and there's a lot of good stuff in there. But I like to go right here because notice what it says. And this is to any cult. This is to any denomination with their handbooks. This is to the Catholic Church. It follows the, the writings of Thomas Aquinas and the traditions of the elders. Notice what it says here. According as he is God, divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and to godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. God has given us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. What are those things? He gave us the Bible, folks. He's given us everything that we need for life and godliness. When that which is perfect is come, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, then that which is in part shall be done away with. We have today everything that we need to go to heaven. It's contained right here in God's word. Whereby, in this, he says, are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, that we can know what God is about, how he is, and we can be like him, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, we're mortifying that. Remember Colossians 3, 5, putting to death those old things of the Bible. I mean, the, excuse me, not that. The old things of, of the world. Uh, Romans 6, 3 and 4, we've been baptized. We've put to death that old man of sin. Uh, we've put that behind us. Now we're going to add these things. He says, and besides this, in addition to, along with, beside this. In other words, beside this, we're going to put this right with it. These great precious promises. What are we going to do? We're going to give all diligence. He's going to say this same thing in verse 10. Wherefore, the rather, rather than give diligence. Same word. It has an idea of excitement, enthusiasm. 
And brethren, I'm telling you, if the Lord's church today, if Christianity in the United States could use anything, it'd be a shot of enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, happiness, excited about the fact that when we die, we are saved. We're going to be with God. We're going to be with each other forever. That is, a, that is something to be excited about. That's something to be enthusiastic about. As a preacher, as, as not even a, just a Christian, to, to, when I go to visit other people who are dying, they are in the last days of their life, but they are children of God. That changes the visit like nothing else. I can look at them and I can tell them, I will see you soon. I am just a few steps behind you, and one day we will be together, and we will have eternity to look back and laugh at some of the stuff that's happened here. We'll have those memories. Not only that, we'll have the memories of all those children of God to talk about from, you know, all the way back to the garden, all the way to however far life goes on. It changes the way we look at it. It's something to be enthusiastic about. It. We have something that nobody else has. We have hope, a real hope. Not just hope we get our house paid off before we die so we have something to leave our kids or hope I can get my car paid off so I can get another one because that's about wore out. Not that, an eternal hope with God, a tabernacle not made with hands but made eternal in the heavens waiting for us. There's no sickness, no sadness, no separation. Everything that we fear and freezes us in this life, gone. Man, that's something to be enthusiastic about. Something to be happy about. And something to try to share with other people, as hard as that may be sometimes. Seems like you bring up religion or Bible or God or anything nowadays and people just shut you down. Uh, I think they'd rather fight about politics than talk about the eternal Father. Uh, it's amazing to me. But given all diligence, excitement, add to your faith virtue. Virtue is a, is a word here. Notice the idea of faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. But this idea of virtue, it's an old word. Paul stayed away from this word a lot of times because it had a lot of pagan consequences in the Greek. They just thought anything that was good was, uh, you know, this arete. take. But uh, the idea behind it is moral goodness, not power, not dunamis. This idea of virtue is a mindset. It's changing the way you think. So when you're having problems with your thoughts, Philippians 4, 8, true, honest, just, pure. When you're having trouble thinking, what should I be doing? Uh, think of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. Think about those things. It's a mindset. I'm so ticked off with that guy right now. I need to what? Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, even as Jesus Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on love. I have got to preach that to myself. I have got to think like that. I have got to make myself go over that time and time again, or I am going to react to somebody pushing my buttons. You know, I am going to be worldly. If I am not convincing myself of the virtuous things that Christ has done and trying to walk like him, then it's only natural that I'm going to act like the world when it comes to these situations. And what does God say? Let your moderation, let your gentleness be known unto all men. That's a hard thing to do. And if we don't convince ourselves mentally, it ain't going to happen. So we have got to add virtue and moral goodness. I want to do what's right. I want to be what's right. You think about, we do that in every aspect in life. You play sports, your coach is going to try to get into your head various things. He's going to preach to you. He's going to try to change your mental attitude and thinking towards the situation. To know that you can do it. To give you the tools to do it. And folks, it's no different in Christianity. We've got to think like the Christ. We've got to think like God would have us to think, or we're not going to act like Christ, and we're not going to act how God would have us to act. You might say, well, Ron, that sounds like brainwashing. Well, we do it and everything else. How many of you here know your ABCs? Yeah, you were brainwashed in the first grade, right? No, you were drilled. You were taught you're going to need that stuff, just as we need this today. Virtue, what's good, a mindset, <clears throat> knowledge. Boy, brethren, if the church of our Lord, if the world in general could use a big shot of something, it would be knowledge. And I ain't talking about school books. I'm not talking about math. I'm not talking about health care. I'm talking about knowledge of God's will and what the Lord would have us to do. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on thine own understanding. 
when God says something is wrong, be good with that. Be good with that. I, I saw uh, somebody threw up a meme on uh, some of the social media, and it was Nadab and Abihu. And, you know, Nadab is talking to Abihu, and he says, uh, Hey, Abihu, do you think we ought to do that? I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, this, this fire didn't come from over here. And Abihu says, No, bro. The Bible didn't say we couldn't. God didn't say we couldn't use this fire over here. And in reality, that was exactly what God, when God says, Use this fire, or God says, This is wrong, folks, it's wrong. And we can try to, you know, lovey-dovey it. We can try to butter it up. We can try to paint a different picture. But the bottom line is, things are wrong. And you may have friends that are homosexuals. They may be some of the most loving people you've ever met in your life, kindest, gentlest, and most caring, and their relationship seems to be so great. But before God, it's sin. It is sin. God made Adam and Eve. And that has been the, that, that is nature. You look out in the animal world, you look in the plant world where there is the sexes of the plants. It's male and female. Without the other, they die. That's how men were created. That's how women are created. It's through procreation. It's through nature. It's through the basics. Of, I mean, even nature itself tells us that certain things are wrong. That's Paul's argument in Romans chapter 1. So the knowledge that that is wrong we need to bring that back. People say, well, you know, the idea of knowledge, uh, gnosis, is the Greek there. It's understanding. It's wrong. It always has been wrong. And yes, people may have a deportment, a, a, uh, a leaning towards something <coughs> that's stronger for them than, say, someone else. Be it drugs, alcohol, gambling, whatever it is. Some people are more attracted to certain things than others. But that doesn't mean it's right. And we need to encourage folks who are in such a situation, give them the understanding, the knowledge that God says that wrong. Proverbs 1 at verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom instruction. There's a lot of people don't want to hear that. It's like, this is my life, this is what I want to do. And so they'll, they'll not listen to that. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You cannot have knowledge and wisdom like you ought to have if you can't accept the fact that when God says something is wrong, it's wrong. The next one we look at is the idea of temperaments. It, temperament is self-control by means of strength. To hold oneself back, self-restraint. That's not something that's very popular in our country today. We're just not a very temperate society. As a matter of fact, we're kind of extravagant in so many ways. From, uh, you know, brethren, this whole deal with... Uh, marijuana and drugs and opioids and stuff I you know sometimes just at a loss oh how over you know my my family has a long history of alcoholism no doubt about it folks that I'm kin to uh, had a real problem with alcohol over the years just go back generations I'm not making this up I'd be happy to talk to you about my family uh, we our men and even some of our ladies a real problem with alcohol and I think now of all the problems that families are having not only with alcohol but now you put in marijuana you put in opioids you put in the psychedelic stuff that I don't even know the name of and the various things that people are coming up with and the people that have problems with the compulsive behavior and then you put that into the mix folks we're not gonna be able to build enough hospitals and mental institutions and things for the folks that are chemically frying themselves out of their own sins. That's the idea of self-control. And boy, our, our nation as a whole could uh, use a real lesson in that. Notice the next thing, patience. The idea of staying cheerful and hopeful in a, in a difficult situation. To be able to stand up under. The, ex the idea of godliness, uh, holiness, loving what God loves. Uh, loving what God loves. You know, and with that comes hating what God hates and being able to tell people that. And the idea of hate is, is to tell folks that's wrong. It'll always be wrong. God has said that is wrong. Not that you don't love the person, but we don't like wickedness because why? We are lovers of God and godliness. Next, brotherly kindness. And brethren, this is something, just because you disagree with someone, just because you're trying to teach someone, they don't know, they're not acting properly, we still have to be kind. We still have to be temperate. Well, sometimes that's 
that's hard to do. The idea of fraternal affection. Philadelphia is the, is the word there. The city gets its name from that. And then the last one, the one that undergirds it all, the idea of love. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you know, love, it just uh, covers a multitude. It believeth all things. It covers a multitude of sins. We're, and not that we're just ignoring it, but we're trying to encourage those people out of it and continue to love them and encourage them and try to build them up in the most holy faith and help them out of the situations that they're in because I think most of us can look back and remember when we needed that kind of love and affection and help out of the situations we're in. It's agape, the capstone of the graces. It's the capstone of love. It's the, what holds it. It's the bond of perfection. It's the glue that holds it all together. For if these things be in you, these graces we just talked about, and abound, that means they are abundant, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you could make 2 Peter chapter 1 the chapter of knowledge. It happens over and over and over in this chapter. you got to know Christianity is a taught religion. It's something that you have to be taught. You have to come to a knowledge of. It's not something you can just hope for. Verse 9, but he that lacketh these things doesn't put on this virtue. He has spiritual myopia, or farsightedness, as they say. He cannot see afar off. And we've forgotten that we were purged from our old sins. Sometimes we're not as loving as we ought to be. We don't show the kind of kindness that we have because we think we're somebody now. Peter says they forgot they were purged from their old sins. Need to think about that. Verse 10, wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence, enthusiasm to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Yeah, the Bible teaches once saved, always saved. If we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. That's right. You do this. You continue to abound in these graces. The Bible says you shall never fall. But the idea of years ago saying, I believe in Jesus, and you can just live your life like you want to and forget about all this, uh, and you're still saved. That's not what scriptures teach. Whoever lacketh these things is blind. Can't see afar off. He's forgotten he's been purged by his old sins. If you do these things, you shall never fall. Verse 11, I don't have it up here, says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Peter says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, even though you know them. That's our job. That's why we're here this morning. That's why we come together. We know these things, brethren. We just need to be reminded from time to time. And if you're like me, you need to be reminded often. That's why I like to commit these things to memory because I just don't have much memory. I have to uh, remind myself, leave notes, mind scripture, bring scripture up in my mind, take it with me wherever I go because it's in my head. Because if not, I'll, I'll lose it. You shall never fall. If you're here this morning, you've never obeyed the gospel, let me encourage you to do that very thing. And as a child of God, if you haven't been what you ought to be, as a matter of fact, these graces are not abounding as they're hard to even see. Then maybe we need to make a change. If it's something public, then by all means make public knowledge of that. If not, then simply a little prayer between you and God. It says, we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, verse 9. So if we can help you in any way, we encourage you to come. As together we stand and while we sing. Softly and tenderly, Jesus.